Acts chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest and Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. So the previous day, Paul saw a great opportunity go unfulfilled when the crowd at the Temple Mount did not allow him to finish his message to them, but they started rioting again. Now Paul had another opportunity to win Israel to Jesus, and perhaps a better opportunity. Here he was speaking to the council with the opportunity to preach Jesus to these influential men. And so this address meant that Paul was both bold in speaking to the council, setting himself on equal footing with them. Uh, the normal address would be rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So Paul probably thought this was an innocent enough way to begin his preaching. He didn't mean that he was sinlessly perfect and that his conscience had never told him that he's wrong. Rather, he meant that he responded to conscience when he had done wrong and had set things right. So nor would Paul ever consider a clear conscience a way to be justified before God. And so Paul might well appeal to the testimony of conscience as he stood before the Supreme Court of Israel. It was on no righteousness of his own, however, that he relied for justification in the heavenly court. The purest conscience was an insecure basis in, of confidence under the scrutiny of God. And so Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 is relevant here. For I know nothing against myself, yet I, I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. So Paul's claim of a good conscience offended the high priest. He thought that someone accused of such serious crime should never claim a clear conscience. Or perhaps he's convicted in his heart by the inherent integrity of Paul's claim. He was a man with good conscience. And it was evident in his speech and countenance. Um, but no matter what his motive was, this order was illegal, for the Jewish law said, He who strikes the cheek of one Israelite strikes, as it were, the glory of God, and he that strikes a man strikes the Holy One. And so the Ananias, who was a high priest at this time, did no honor to the office. He was well known for his greed, and the ancient Jewish historian Josephus will tell of how Ananias stole for himself the tithes that belonged to the common priest. Verses 3-5, through five. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So we wish we knew how Paul said these words. It would have helped to hear Paul's tone of voice. Was it an outburst of anger or was it calm, collected rebuke with that, you know, with what a lot of weight to it? Whatever the tone, the rebuke was entirely accurate and justified. The man who commanded that a defenseless man be punched in the face indeed was a whitewashed wall, a white veneer of purity covering an over an obvious corruption. And so Paul exposed the hypocrisy of the men who made the command. And the men of the council were supposed to be an example of the law of Moses. The command to have Paul struck was in fact contrary to both the spirit and the letter of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 1 and 2 says only a man found guilty can be beaten. And Paul had not yet been found guilty of anything. <clears throat> and so Paul's words, you know, God will strike you were more prophetic than he realized because in Ananias' final days, despite all of his scheming and bribes, were lived as a hunted animal and ended at the hands of his own people. So Paul instantly knew that he was wrong in his outburst, no matter how he said it. He agreed that it's wrong to speak evil of the ruler of your people in Exodus 22 verse 28. Yet Paul excused himself, claiming that he did not know that the man who commanded the punch was Ananias the high priest. This isn't unreasonable since Paul had been away from the council and the high circles of the Jewish authority in Jerusalem for more than 20 years. Probably he didn't recognize the man who gave the command to strike him as the high priest. However, some out there will think that he did not know because Paul's eyesight was bad. This is an inference from Galatians chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 and chapter 6 verse 11 as well as from early written church traditions. Others think that Paul was being sarcastic with the idea, I didn't think that anybody who acted in such a manner could be the high priest. Verse 6, 
But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. So Paul seems to have read his audience and saw that they were not conductive to the gospel. Uh, The actions of the high priest and the attitudes of those present made this plain. So Paul gave up on preaching the gospel and did what he could to preserve his liberty before a council that wanted to kill him. So Paul's course was to divide the Sanhedrin amongst their party lines uh, to get to make a side of the Pharisees sympathetic with him instead of having them united against him. And so, knowing his audience, Paul referred to his heritage as a Pharisee and declared, Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. He knew this was a matter of great controversy between these two parties. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And of course, this was an essentially true claim. The center of Paul's gospel was a resurrected Jesus. He was being judged over the matter of the resurrection of the dead. Verse 7 through 9. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So Paul picked the right issue here. Framed in these terms, he immediately gained the Pharisees as an ally, and he let them argue it out with the Sadducees. The Sadducees were theological liberals of their day and denied the reality of life after death and the concept of a resurrection. Right? The Sadducees say that there's no resurrection and no angel or spirit. And so the Pharisees were more likely to find some ground of agreement with Paul, being the more the Bible believers in the uh, Jewish world of that time. They took the Bible seriously, even if they did make mistakes uh, by adding the traditions of men to what they received in the Bible. So usually the Sadducees and the Pharisees were bitter enemies, but they were able to unite in opposition against Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, John chapter 11, Uh, as well as Paul. So it's strange how people with nothing in common will come together as friends to oppose God or his work. And So it says, let us not fight against God. In saying this, the Pharisees recommended a return to advice of their great leader Gamaliel, as recorded in Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39, where he says, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. All right, verse 10. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. So the commander had to be certain that these Jews were crazy in their endless and violent uh, disputes. Previously, they rioted over one word, Gentiles. Now, the distinguished men of the council fought over one word, resurrection. And so, the commander removed Paul for his own safety and left him in the custody of the barracks. Paul's clever ploy rescued him from the council, but he could not have been happy with the results. He had the opportunity to preach to a huge crowd of attentive Jews on the Temple Mount, and it ended in failure. Then he had the opportunity to preach to the influential Jewish council, and that ended in a fistfight. And so later, Paul seemed to suggest that this tactic of bringing up the resurrection controversy in the way that he did was not good. He suggests that it was wrongdoing on his part in Acts 24, verses uh, 20 and 21, right? Where he says, Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Verse 11. But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So this must have been a difficult night for Paul. His heart longed for the salvation of his fellow Jews in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. And two great opportunities came to nothing. And it would be no surprise if Paul blamed himself for the missed opportunity before the Sanhedrin. It could be said that his reaction to the punch commanded by the high priest spoiled everything. 
And so perhaps with tears, Paul mourned these lost opportunities for God and how he might have spoiled them. And at moments like these, one is often tormented with a deep sense of unworthiness and unusableness before God. You know, perhaps he's thinking that this is the end of his ministry. And so, <clears throat> but in the darkness of that night, when fears came upon Paul, it was in that darkness of the night that Jesus came to Paul and stood by him. So Jesus' physical presence, as it seems was the case, with Paul was a unique manifestation. But Jesus promised every believer to always be with them in Matthew 28, verse 20, where he says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus knew where Paul was. He did not lose sight of Paul because he's in jail. And uh, Paul was alone, but he wasn't alone. You know, if everyone else forsook him, Jesus was enough. Better to be in jail with the Lord than to be in heaven without him. <clears throat> so Paul had been miraculously delivered from jail cells before, but this time the Lord met him right in the jail cell. We often demand that Jesus deliver us out of our circumstances when he wants to meet us right in them. We sometimes think we are sur surrendering to Jesus when we're really only demanding an escape. God wants us to meet us in whatever we face at the moment. And so Jesus was not only with Paul. He gave him words of comfort, be of good cheer. Tells us that the night brought with, an, with it an emotional and perhaps spiritual darkness upon Paul. Jesus was there to cheer uh, his faithful servant after he spent himself for Jesus' sake. And so Jesus would not have said, be of good cheer, unless Paul needed to hear those words. Paul knew his situation was bad, but he didn't know the half of it. The next day, 40 Jewish assassins would gather together and vow to go on a hunger strike until they murdered Paul. Paul didn't know this would happen, but Jesus did. Yet he could still say, be of good cheer. And so you might think that things are bad right now, but you may not even know the half of it. But Jesus knows, and he still says to you, be of good cheer. Why? Not because everything's fine, but because God is still on his throne, and he still holds to his promise that... Romans chapter 8 verse 28 all things work together for good for to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose so anybody can be of good cheer when everything is great but the Christian can be of good cheer when everything is rotten knowing that God is mighty and wonderful no matter what the crisis of the moment and so be of good cheer is only one word in the ancient Greek and it's used five times in the New Testament each time it's used by Jesus Jesus told the bedridden uh, paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. He tells the woman with the 12-year bleeding problem, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well in chapter 9, verse 22 of Matthew. He told his frightened disciples in the Sea of Galilee, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid in Matthew 14, verse 27. He told his disciples the night before his crucifixion, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world in John 16, verse 33. And here in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, Jesus told Paul, Be of good cheer. And so Jesus remembered what Paul had done in Jerusalem and told Paul that there remained more work for him to do in Rome. So Paul could have been discouraged about the lack of results from the sermon in Jerusalem, but the results were not his responsibility. His responsibility was to bring the word of God and to testify of Jesus. The results were God's responsibility. You testify before me in Jerusalem means that Jesus complimented Paul on a job well done. Yet, though Paul had done a good job, there was much more to do. You must bear witness at Rome was Paul's next assignment. Right, And the greatest words a faithful child of God can hear are, There is more for you to do. Those words grieve the lazy servant, but they bring joy to a faithful servant. And it could be said to every child of God, There is more for you to do. More people to bring to Christ. More ways for you to glorify Him. More people to pray with. More humble ways to serve His people. More hungry to feed. More naked to clothe. More weary saints for you to encourage. So the promise of more work to do was a promise of continued protection. Paul had to live until he had finished the course that God had appointed for him. Paul really wanted to go on to Rome in Acts 19 verse 21 and Romans chapter 1 verses 9 through 12. Sometimes we think that just because we want something a lot, it couldn't be God's will for us. But God often gives us the desires of our hearts <clears throat> in Psalm 37 verse 4. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So the timing of this promise was especially, uh, especially precious. It didn't look like Paul could get out of Jerusalem alive, much less take it to Rome. God not only knows what we need to hear, he knows when we need to hear it. And so Paul faced his enemies the next day with a smile, knowing that they were powerless against him because God had more for him to do. <clears throat> Verse 12 through 15. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither, neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy, and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So in the days of Paul and Jesus, there was a secretive group of Jewish assassins who targeted the Romans and their supporters. They were dagger men because they often concealed daggers and stabbed Roman soldiers as they walked by. It seems that these same kind of assassins now targeted Paul. So they were so zealous that they made a vow not to eat or even drink until Paul was dead. This is a high level of commitment. And these men lacked nothing in commitment or zeal, but their zeal was not according to the knowledge. In Romans chapter 10 verse 2, zeal and devotion by themselves never prove that someone is right with God. And the assassins wanted the chief priests and elders to lie to the Roman commander, pretended that they wanted another meeting with Paul. Their lie was a sin, and men who would have been committed to the law of God were instead happy to sin against him. They were zealous, but still willing to lie and sin to accomplish their supposedly godly goals. Verse 16 through 22. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside, and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them. For more than forty of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink until they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young men depart and commanded him, Tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. So it was no accident that this happened. God had to protect Paul because Jesus promised that he would let... Uh, he would go to Rome and testify of him in verse 11. And Paul had committed no crime, yet he was a prisoner, because the Roman commander suspected that he might be a revolutionary of some kind. Paul had to be kept in custody until the facts of his case could be discovered. Verse 23 and 24. And he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and two hundred spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, and provide mounts to set Paul on, and bring him safely to Felix the governor. So 470 trained Roman soldiers would escort Paul out of Jerusalem. It was as if God wanted to exaggerate his faithfulness to Paul and to show him beyond any doubt that the promise of Jesus was true. Not only did Paul escape Jerusalem alive, he did so riding a horse. Actually, several mounts were made available to Paul. Verse 25 through 30. He wrote a letter in the following manner. Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him. Having learned that he was a Roman, and when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you, and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So in his letter... Lysias implied that he learned of Paul's Roman citizenship right away, and he said nothing of the way Paul was bound twice and almost scourged for the sake of interrogation. For Luke, he had an important line in the letter. He had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. It's possible that Roman officials reviewed the book of Acts before Paul's trial before Caesar. Here, Luke showed that other Roman officials had judged Paul not guilty. Verse 31 through 33. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. 
And the next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. So the 200 soldiers only went as far as uh, Antipatris because the most dangerous part of the road was only up to this point. Uh, up to Antipatris, which is about 25 miles, uh, the country was dangerous and inhabited by Jews. After that, the country was open and flat, which was quite unsuited for any ambush or largely it was also largely inhabited by Gentiles. And so Paul made it out of Jerusalem into Caesarea on the coast. The plot of the 40 assassins failed. And some wonder if the men who made the vow of fasting died because they failed in their mission to kill Paul. It's probably not the case. Ancient rabbis allowed for four types of vows to be broken. Vows of uh, incitement, vows of exaggeration, vows made in error, and vows that cannot be fulfilled by reason of constraint. Uh, exclusions allowing for almost any contingency, right? There's <laughs> always an excuse to, to back out of it. Verse 34 and 35. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. So perhaps Felix hoped that Paul came from some place that required that someone else hear his case, apparently learning that he was... Um, from Cilicia meant that Felix would indeed be responsible to hear and rule on his case. And it would be Paul's first opportunity to speak to someone at this level of authority, the governor. This was the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise made to Paul some 20 years earlier, that he would bear the name of Jesus to kings in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And this is going to begin a two-year period of, conf of confinement for Paul in Caesarea. After that, he spent at least two years in Rome. Taken together with travel time, the next five years of Paul's life were lived in Roman custody. And this is a striking contrast to his previous years of wide and spontaneous travel. And so Paul lived many years with great freedom, and he had to trust the promises of God through those years. Yet he also had to trust the promises of Jesus in his years of little freedom, and to know that God could work just as powerfully through these uh, more difficult circumstances. So Paul needed to receive the promise of Jesus, both promises from 20 years before and promises recently made, to receive them with confident faith, allowing those promises to make a difference in how he thought and even felt. Right, Every believer must do the same.